Ben, can you see that? We can. We can see it and we can hear you perfectly. And Wonderful. thanks, Dr. Pai. The floor Thank is you. yours. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending my lecture this morning. Uh, I know it's a Saturday morning, so I want to just really appreciate you all taking the time to really understand and, and, and take this whole weekend and the whole week of listening to wonderful, wonderful speakers. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, COVID a little bit, chronic disease and cancer, and really how it relates to inflammation and how you can reduce and lower your inflammation safely and naturally. Um, for those who missed my lecture last year, definitely you can you know, sign up for The Real Truth About Health, or you can uh, go to our website, sanjevany.net, look under media, and you'll see the interview from last year. But today, I'm going to take a different spin than I did last year. Some things will be very similar just in the beginning, but really I'm going to take a, a far, far turn because there's so much more information to talk about. And I really wanted to get into an area that sometimes is uncomfortable for some of the providers in this lecture series uh, and talk about what can you take. So aside of the diet, we want to look at what are the options available, safe effectively uh, um, for you. So let's get started. Let me get this real quick. Okay, so last year, interesting thing is when I, when I came here last year, something has changed. What has changed is that we actually were about 3.7 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars that we spent um, on healthcare last year. And actually, our, it went up uh, to 18%. So it was almost 16.9% uh, GDP last year. So, you know, the, the rising cost of our healthcare, as you can see, is tremendous. And we're still spending, you know, hundreds of billions, almost, almost $400 billion on prescription drugs. And with that, what did it get us? We're still ranking at the bottom of 16 uh, democracies for death from all causes. That means in the United States, we die from more of infant mortality, homicides, teen pregnancy, HIV, AIDS, drug-related deaths, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, chronic lung disease, and disability. And now, you know, in fact, you know, in the next couple of slides, we'll see with COVID, we have to add that to the list. Now, what did this bias is that we're, we're not living longer with this expensive healthcare, is that we're ranking 34 out of 35 countries in terms of life expectancy, and actually we're going to drop further due to the COVID results. And now we're ranking 46 out of 40 industri industrial nations in terms of outcomes of all chronic disease. So what does this mean? That means of all chronic diseases in all the other 48 industrial nations, we are 46. So, you know, when I talk to politicians or if you, you know, if you go to your senator or congressman or governor uh, in your state, you know, the, I think that the, the false uh, understanding or belief system that we may all have is that, you know, as Americans, we think and we used to be, believe it or not, you know, in the top three of something of everything in every category. But that is not true with health. We're 46. So we have to say, what is this buying us and how do we change this pro uh, projection of, you know, spending more and actually getting less? And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, who's the 43, 44, 45th country uh, that's ahead of us, and it's Dominican Republic, Turkey, and Iran. So you have to, we have to understand, like, we're definitely in a wrong place right now in terms of where we're going with healthcare. And when I showed this slide last year, it was it was under the pretense of of having you know medicine kind of being controlled by you know insurance companies, you know drug company lobby groups. You know, in fact, you know with the the drug company lobbies, there's about 1,500 lobbyists in Washington right now that are right now. You have a kitchen fire, or your living room's on fire, or your bed's on fire. Then there's a problem. Right? So we need to have some, but we don't want to have too much. It's a balancing act. And the problem is, you know, when we have acute inflammation, now acute inflammation is usually very important because the body needs to respond to something. So say, for example, someone does get uh, a virus or a flu or, or bronchitis, for example, the body evokes an immune reaction to stimulate its immune system to go fight. We, we evoke a fever. Fever is a good thing, actually. We don't want to suppress fever. We want, you know, if someone has a, a 99, 100, 101, 102, totally fine. We want the body to help upregulate. We don't want to downregulate or actually suppress fever. Actually, they will extend the, 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 the rate or the risk of the infection. However, if it's over 104, obviously, then it can be very dangerous. Then we have to look at lowering it. But for most, most people that have a common cold or flu, we don't want to suppress the inf that, that acute inflammatory response. Same thing when we, um, for example, when we uh, sprain an ankle, when you sprain an ankle, that acute inflammation around your ankle that is um, like sw swollen, the body's saying, hey, I'm damaged. I'm going to put like a temporary biological cast to prevent you from moving it so we can repair and rejuvenate and restore that function. So acute inflammation in general is usually very helpful because it's trying to like address the immediate situation and fix it. The problem is when we get to chronic inflammation, that's the big problem. Chronic inflammation leads to chronic diseases. So if you can see here on the picture, you see a healthy knee. And then when we see chronic inflammation of the joint, we call it arthritis. You know, a healthy colon, chronic inflammation, we call it colitis. 
heart disease. You know, there's many, many speakers on this panel uh, this week. Uh, Dr. Grieger, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, all my colleagues who I who I who I've trained with, who I studied with, who I who I admire, who I recommend my patients to read and watch their movies as well and books, uh, and, and tons of like Milton Mills and Brenda Davis and you know v- variety of other cardiologists and interventionalists uh, that have been on even Baxter, all these wonderful physicians, and they've all talked about this. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you know cardiovascular disease number one cause of death still three people every minute in the United States having a heart attack, three people every minute have having a heart attack. Let me say it again. Three people every minute in America having a heart attack, which is which is unbelievable, right? But this is due to chronic inflammation and that inflammation eating animal protein containing cholesterol and having a pro-inflammatory diet, which is predominantly from animal proteins and also re- refined and fried foods as well as stress and a lot of other variety of factors causes these vessels to end up having more arterial sclerotic plaque and leading to heart attacks and strokes. And what we're seeing now more and more in the population, which is going to be projecting to, to bankrupt the country, is the, the, the chronic onset now in, in the adult population, in the aging population of cognitive uh, disorders such as Alzheimer's and dementias and, and Parkinson's disease. This is just chronic inflammation in the brain over decades. So what we now have is we have you know, 200 different itises. I call it the, the hokey pokey of, of inflammation because what, that, what I mean by that is, you know, let's start from the top of your head. So say if you had an itchy scalp or you know, kind of a dandruff, thing, they'll call it dermatitis, right? Then you have red eyes, you call it conjunctivitis, runny nose, rhinitis. People get you know, congestion in their, in their sinus cavity, we call it sinusitis, right? Then we can have like a pharyngitis, a sore throat, a laryngitis. My voice is a little bit hoarse because I've been talking all week. You know, people can have a thyroiditis, you know, esophagus which is heartburn, gastritis, stomach pain, colitis, prostatitis, vaginitis, you know, arthritis, tendonitis. So as you can see, there's 200 right now medical conditions that are inflammatory related. The problem is, is what we do is that we just end up treating the symptoms with medications, right? So you go to the eye doctor, there's eye drops. You go to the ENT, ear, nose, and throat doctor, they give you nasal spray. You go to the lung doctor, here's an inhaler. You go to a, you know, the GI doctor, they give you an upper pill or a lower pill. You know, you go to the, 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 the urologist or, or the gynecologist, you're getting some kind of genital urinal uh, medication, right? So for lowering inflammation, but our main cause or my, my whole uh, uh, ability to help my clients is looking at, well, what's the underlying triggering mechanisms that causes the inflammation in that individual? What is the dietary lifestyle environment and belief system, all the epigenetics that are causing that? And, and the furthermore, is that, that it's out of the chronic disease is that inflammation over time can lead to cancer. So almost 50% of patients that have you know, ulcerative colitis, that means inflammation in the colon, develop a colon cancer in about 30 years. Active rheumatoid arthritis patients over 10 years, and actually last year I gave the example because I had a patient who was exactly around 11 years of having active rheumatoid arthritis and ended up having a lymphoma. Right? So it's 71 times higher rate of lymphoma than the general population because when the body's so on fire everywhere, then it just goes to the next level of dysfunction. The body cannot fight, fix, and repair. And even viruses like HPV, you know, with cervical, uh, cervical tissue, women get pap smears. It doesn't mean that HPV will cause cancer, but there's a higher risk over 10 to 20 years of HPV causing chronic inflammation into the cervical cells. And anything that has chronic inflammation over time, if it doesn't repair or reverse, then it can turn into a cancer. But here's the benefit. Chronic disease and cancers are completely preventable and require major changes in lifestyle. So if you look at this, you know, we look at tobacco is a big contributing factor. So don't smoke. Okay. Unfortunately, there's a big rise in vaping and there's a section in my book. Uh, and now you can understand how vaping is also uh, dangerous for you. But diet's the largest contributing factor. So we have to change the diet. We have to lower our weight. We have to get our immune system up so that we're not getting infections. And then we also have to clean up our environment. Unfortunately, there's so much toxicities, right? So we have to be looking at more organic, non-GMO, less chemicals on our body and our homes. And you know, this when the study came out originally in 2009, it was looking at you know kind of five percent. They were saying you know to 10 percent of genes were related to disease. But now. The most recent research is showing it's less than 3%. So let's focus on the 97% that you can control.